Ok, bonsoir, euh, bonsoir, bah, euh... <rire> ça part bien, <rire> j'ai pensé que cet apéro, euh, c'était pas, <rire> pas une bonne idée, j'ai champagne à midi, enfin, voilà, bienvenue à tous, donc euh, je suis vraiment euh, extrêmement heureux et flatté de pouvoir euh, faire un petit panégérique de, de Rasmus Bro, euh, pour, pour plein de raisons, euh, la première c'est que je suis vraiment heureux qu'il soit là. J'avais essayé de le faire venir à Genève en 2015. Malheureusement, ça n'avait pas joué. Donc, euh, c'était que partie remise. Et c'est vraiment un plaisir et un honneur qu'il ait accepté euh, d'être là cet après-midi euh, pour nous. Euh, on a reçu, quelques, il y a quelques jours, de la part de Gilbert, euh, un lien pour pouvoir télécharger le, le, le CV des, des orateurs. Alors, j'ai fait ça. J'ai euh, appuyé sur, euh, sur le lien, j'ai lancé l'impression, puis je me suis dit, mais mon imprimante a un problème, ça n'arrêtait pas de sortir. Et il y a eu un dossier absolument énorme euh, qui est sorti pour, euh, pour expliquer qui était Rasmus Bro. Euh, c'est vraiment trop long, mais je crois que s'il y a des mots, un mot qui résume euh, la situation, c'est l'excellence. Euh, l'excellence à tous les niveaux, au niveau scientifique, au niveau de sa carrière, c'est vraiment une chance et un individu brillant. J'ai vu aussi qu'il avait commencé, il avait fait un stage en, en 2000 chez, chez Mustapha, donc euh, vous voyez que euh, c'est des germes qui viennent aussi avec notre communauté. Et puis pour la petite histoire, ben, voilà, il est né le 28 juillet 1965, moi le 30 juillet. Il m'a dit que ben, quand on était bébé, on avait au moins un point commun, c'est qu'on écoutait les Rolling Stones. Euh, donc voilà. Euh, je suis aussi extrêmement heureux parce qu'il va parler de, de parafac et puis il va faire un lien, comme j'ai cru voir dans le résumé, avec la chromatographie. Alors comme euh, euh, science de la séparation, je trouve que c'est vraiment une magnifique image de, de réunir ces, ces communautés. Donc euh, merci euh, Rasmus et puis euh, floor is yours. Thank you very much. I hope uh, I didn't understand it, but uh, <laughs> I appreciate it maybe. Um... Thank you very much for inviting me here. Uh, so I'm going to talk about what is called multi-way analysis. And nowadays, it's also called tensor analysis. And it's all the same. Tensors just make it sound more scary and more impressive. But it's uh, really the same thing. So uh, don't worry about that. And I was told to talk a, a little bit about fluorescence, uh, because we worked a lot with fluorescence. Uh, so I'm going to start with talking a little bit about how we can use uh, multi-way analysis for uh, figuring out fluorescence data, and then I will talk a little bit about uh, chromatography as well. So first of all, what's a freeway array? Well, that's very simple because that's just a box of data. So normally we work with matrices, but when we have, for example, measured spectra as a, as a function of time, then for each and every sample we have, we have a matrix of data instead of just a line of data. And that will give us a freeway array. And naturally, if you can have freeway arrays, you can also have four-way and five-way and nine-way or whatever. As soon as you go beyond sort of uh, two-way data, it's kind of simple to extend it. And it turns out that a lot of data is actually freeway or higher-way data. So it's, it's uh, relevant to uh, worry about. One complication, which we're not going to talk much about here, is that all our mathematical notation is based on linear algebra. And linear algebra is made for matrices. So when you go into the scientific literature about freeway arrays and multi-way analysis, it's going to look complicated. But it actually isn't complicated at all. But it's just because we don't have a good notation for tensors in general. Actually, we have many because that's not sort of a standard. So that's a little complicated. But it, that's an artificial complication. Well, let me give you some examples of where we have freeway data. One example that we work a lot, a lot with, because I'm in a food department, is sensory analysis. So we measure several food items using several judges, and they assess the foods on many different attributes. That would give you freeway data. In batches, you got something similar. Many times of spectroscopy will actually lead to freeway data because if you measure spectroscopy as a function of time, as a function of treatment, as a function of whatever, then you will naturally get uh, freeway data. And also, for example, chromatography that we will talk about uh, shortly. Well, what we traditionally do with freeway data is that we turn it into two-way data. 
And that way we can use our standard tools so we can do PCA or PLS if that's what we want, whatever we want. But, but there's several complications. First of all, you can see that there are three different ways that we can actually turn a freeway array into a two-way uh, matrix. We call that unfolding or matricization. So you have to think a little bit about which sort of reorganization is going to be uh, nice for you. And one of the problems with that in general is that it often leads to overfitting. Not always, but very often because you have many, many more parameters. You can imagine that if you have a spectrum that's a thousand uh, wavelengths and you have measured at a hundred occasions, now you actually have a hundred thousand variables when you unfold. And that means many more parameters and that means you're going to get more shaky results, less robust results. So if a freeway model could be used, you would get more robustness. Now, just like we have, for example, PCA and PLS, we have methods that actually work directly on the freeway arrays. So for example, instead of PCA, we have something called Parafac, which is an extension. And we actually have two extensions. We have another one called the Tucker Free model. So depending on what properties of PCA you want to extend, there are two different extensions. I'm only going to focus on Parafac here, but the Tucker model is actually also very interesting. Basically, any model you can imagine for a two-way data set, you can develop something similar for freeway data. So you don't have to do this unfolding. People do this unfolding out of necessity. Now, sometimes you do it because it's a choice, a deliberate choice, and that's perfectly fine. But in many cases, people just do it because they have no idea how to deal with the freeway data, which is also legitimate, but it's a pity. So you should do unfolding if that's the right thing to do, not because your software doesn't allow it or whatever. Okay, so let me explain the Parafact model because that's arguably the most sort of prominent uh, model that we have in freeway analysis. Uh, and in order to do that, I'll start with the, the PCA model. Now the PCA model, it's easiest uh, to describe it graphically. Here's a two component PCA model of a matrix. So we have scores and loadings scores and loadings for the different components and then some residuals. That's fairly easy. Now I've written the model up here in scalar notation, which is not very intuitive, but it has the advantage that it actually extends to freeway data. So bear with that. If I have a freeway array X instead of a matrix, the only thing that changes is that I get a new set of loadings. So instead of having scores and loadings, I now have scores and two sets of loadings. So every component is a score and two sets of loadings. And that's the only difference there is. So it's really the same as PCA conceptually with scores and loadings. And even though it's a freeway array and a tensor and whatever, it's not really complicated. And you can see that if you sort of accept the scalar notation, then the extension to freeway is really easy. And also to four-way, five-way, and nine-way, uh, what have you. So that's the Parafact model. That was developed in 1970 by a guy called Richard Hasman, who was really an intelligent guy, a bright guy. And it was actually based on discussions on PCA in the 40s. So back in the 40s in psychometrics, people were debating how to rotate PCA models. And they were looking into orthomax and varimax and all kinds of rotation. And they, there was wild discussions about what is the right way to rotate. We have all these different ways to rotate, but what's the right way? And then this guy called Cattell, he came up with an idea that if you have not one but two matrices, where you look at your system from two different perspectives, then you're going to find that here you have rotational freedom and here you have rotational freedom, but there's only going to be one that actually satisfies both of them. And he called that parallel proportional profiles. And he said that was the fundamentally right rotation. And that was not operational or useful, it was a theoretical construct. But Harshman in 1970 developed that into something constructive, not just with two matrices, but with many matrices, so a freeway array. And that's why it's called Parafact, because it means parallel factor analysis. Uh, so that's the concept. So it has a kind of an interesting origin.
Well, let me show you what is special about Parafac, and I'll show that using uh, what we work a lot with, fluorescence uh, spectroscopy. So, for example, in environmental monitoring, people use fluorescence spectroscopy for monitoring aqueous systems, uh, monitoring pollution, for example, in aqueous uh, systems, uh, because the fluorescence will reflect the organic matter, and here people are really interested in the organic matter. And I'm guessing you're all familiar with fluorescence spectroscopy, but when we do excitation emission spectroscopy, then we get a, uh, a matrix for every sample. So we measure as a function of excitation and emission. And basically every peak is a chemical, except if we have uh, Rayleigh-Raman scattering, but uh, never mind that for now. So anyway, we get a matrix from every measurement that we get. Now, until very recently, the state of the art in sort of dissolved organic matter in environmental analysis was to look at these matrices and, and then sort of say, okay, if it's in the low area, we've got protein fluorescence, in the high area, we've got humic substances and things like that. And that's very sad. That's very little to get out of your data. You measure such nice data like this, and then you just sort of, either you just look, or maybe you integrate different areas. That's not very sort of impressive, uh, and you can do much better than that. So, I want to show you just so to have a look at it. This is one matrix just shown from different views, just so that you're sort of uh, comfortable with a, a excitation emission matrix. This particular sample seems to have three peaks, uh, so three underlying chemicals. You can almost see what they are here, what the underlying emission spectra should be. But if I take this matrix and I do free, uh, sorry, I do PCA on that, I'm going to find these scores and loadings. Uh, which is not really very sort of impressive given that we can almost see what's in there. And just because I understand that that's an issue here, uh, I also uh, wrote that ICA would also have problems with this type of data, hoping to provoke someone. I'm, I haven't understood who it is, but, uh, but we'll see. But anyway, this kind of overlapping data cannot really be resolved, also not with curve resolution, because, because there's no selectivity. So you're going to have rotational freedom no matter what you do. You're not going to find the fundamental solution. Well, Parafac will, and that's the beauty of Parafac. Let me show you Beer's law for fluorescence data. So here's a fluorescence landscape, and you can see clearly one peak. And actually, when you look at it from the side, you can see that there is also a shoulder on this peak, hence another compound, and there's even a third shoulder. So there's three compounds. This is a mixture of three compounds. Now, if I knew my chemistry, if I knew what was in here, I could actually describe it just using Lambert Beer's law or, or something to that effect, uh, a fluorescence law, because it's a contribution of three different uh, contributions from each of the chemical compounds. And those chemical compounds, each of them are going to have a unique emission spectrum. So each of them has a different emission spectrum, and each of them will also have a unique excitation spectrum. And if I'm only measuring, let's say I'm only measuring this compound here, I'm going to measure the outer product of these two vectors. So that means a landscape that has the shape of these two. So no matter where I look from this side or from the other side, it's going to look the same. It's the same shape. And if I change the concentration, the only thing that's going to change is going to be the magnitude. So I just have to multiply it by a scalar if I knew that. So if I take these outer products, multiply by the concentration, and add them together, then I get my fluorescence landscape. Now this is Lambert Beer's law. That's what Lambert Beer's law is, is saying. So I only need to know the pure emission spectra, the pure excitation spectra, and the free concentrations, for example. So let's take uh, several samples. So here you see one particular sample, and I could describe that as a sum of contributions from three different compounds, a blue and a green and a red one. But in this particular sample, there's only the blue one, so I just multiply the red and green by a zero concentration, and I can model this one. And if I take a completely different sample like this one, it has only the red compound, but I can use exactly the same excitation and emission matrices, and I just multiply the green and the blue one by zero. No matter what combination 
I have of these fluorophores, I can use the same basis set, the same set of vectors, just uh, changing the concentrations. Now this is all Beer's law, but as it happens to be, this is also parafac. So if I take these five mixtures, and I build a free component parafact model, it's going to find the concentrations of compound one, the emission spectra of, com of compound one, and the excitation spectrum of compound one, and of component two and component three. So basically, the, the uh, parafact model can separate the mixtures into the underlying entities. And that's chromatography. We are separating mathematically. So we are separating mixtures into the basic entities. That's exactly the same as chromatography. And it has exactly the same properties. For example, it's not quantitative chromatography. You cannot get moles per liter from chromatography. You get relative concentrations. And we get the same here. And we also have to identify what does this spectrum mean like you do in chromatography. It doesn't tell you what the compound is. You have to figure that out somehow. So. Instead of just looking at these, we can take all the samples, build a parafact model, and in this particular case, uh, we get uh, five components, and they make chemical sense. So now, instead of just guessing and overlooking the small subtleties, we get everything, and we get everything quantified. So we get a concentration of each of these uh, five compounds in all the samples, and that's really neat. And that's what we call mathematical chromatography. And it's based on the fact that the Parafact model is mathematically unique. Now, the PCA model or the uh, uh, MCR model is not unique. It has rotational freedom. The Parafact model has no rotational freedom. If I say I want a five-component model, there's only one. And that means if my data follows Beer's law, and this is necessary, if my data is following Beer's law, I'm going to get the pure spectra under some conditions, but they're fairly okay. So that means we can separate, we can get uh, relative concentrations, we can get pure spectra and profiles and stuff like that. That's also the reason for why we can do what is called second order calibration. I can actually take one pure sample of tryptophan and with that I can, that can be my calibration set, and with that I can measure the concentration of tryptophan in a beer sample and a coffee sample. I don't have to calibrate for all the interferences, because Parafact will separate them and only look at the one, uh, extract the one I'm interested in. So I can actually build calibration models that work for unknown samples with unknown interferences, which is very unlike to what you can do with, uh, for example, PLS. Okay, let me show you uh, just two examples. This first one is about uh, uh, cancer. Uh, we do a lot of uh, work on cancer, and this is actually, this is not really our best results or anything, uh, but, but it's, a, it's a nice example uh, because it shows you a little bit about what you can extract uh, with the Parafact model. So here we have a fluorescence landscape of a blood sample. Uh, of some women with uh, breast cancer. Well, this is one particular woman. Now, there's information in this protein area about cancer, but I'm not going to look into that. I'm going to look into this small area here because it turns out that we can actually also build models in this uh, area here. This is what the landscape looks like here. But when I build a Parafact model in, with all the samples I have, I actually find four components which is pretty impressive, uh, I think. It, they are quite noisy, but, but, but we can still interpret them. They, they are reflecting, or oh, the axes are wrong here, but they're reflecting porphyrins and, and, and things like that, and they make chemical sense. And if I take two of, just two of these concentrations and plot against each other, I get a really nice uh, separation of cancer, non-cancer, and these are not very progressed cancers, so, so that's a nice result. In itself, it's not uh, good enough, and, and this is not all we can get out of these data, but it's just to show you that we can work with really low signal-to-noise and still find interesting results. Another nice example of what we can do with, uh, with sort of uh, funny sampling is, uh, is a honey, uh, honey uh, adulteration is an issue in many places. Uh, in this particular case, we work with some people in Serbia where there's a lot of adulteration uh, of honey. So we wanted to look into whether fluorescence could be useful. It makes kind of sense because there's a lot of fluorescing compounds in, in, uh, in honey that could be uh, indicative of whether you have sort of uh, 
played around with the honey. So we took a data set, uh, different types of honey, and also added some fake ones where we added sugar solutions and, and stuff like that. That's how one of the ways that you normally uh, try to uh, cheat with uh, this. Here's just the emission spectra of two particular types of honey. And you can see that the spectra are really uh, overlapping quite a lot, uh, which is why it, it's actually difficult to distinguish them uh, sort of visually. But when we take all the samples, we have about 100 fluorescent samples, and we can build a nice uh, um, parafag model uh, using these 100 samples. This is front face, so the spectra are not completely impressive uh, uh, due to the way we sample. But we, uh, we get six components, and that means the fluorescence in all these samples can be described in terms of these six chemical uh, compounds. And that means for each of these samples, we have a concentration that we can use. And that's the whole story from a fluorescence point of view. So the whole fluorescence story will be in these six concentrations. They uh, sort of uh, condense uh, all the fluorescence. So now we have names and just six uh, uh, compounds. And of course, we can build, we can plot them, but we can also build, for example, any kind of classification model and build fairly good uh, classification models. Not perfect, which also actually makes sense here, but, but pretty good uh, models, uh, better than uh, the alternatives we have. So that's a very nice sort of use of this because fluorescence is simple, it's cheap. I mean, it, doesn't co it basically doesn't cost anything to do a fluorescence uh, measurement. And the model is very chemical, so it's, it's easier to validate that way. Because of Parafag, we get chemical compounds. It's not, it's not abstract compounds. So it's a chemical decision that we're making. It's based on chemical uh, concentrations. OK, so these were different examples of how we can use Parafag on fluorescence data. And now I would like to uh, talk a little bit about uh, more complicated data. Uh, in particular, GCMS, it's, it's also going to be valid for other kinds of uh, chromatography, uh, but we focus a lot on GCMS. And in GCMS, we have some problems every now and then that we would like to fix, and Parafag is not able to fix these, uh, but we'll look into that. So this is a typical data set that we have. So this is the tick, so this is sort of the, the sum dilution profile of different samples. These are yogurts. Now, if what, what we typically do is we work a lot with food, with gastronomy, and also with proteomics and, and stuff like that. So what we do is normally we do untargeted analysis. We want to find 100 different metabolites or 100 different um, aroma compounds. We're not interested in one particular compound. If we were only interested in one, we could fix, sort of fix our procedure towards that, but we're interested in everything, so we cannot optimize it perfectly. There's going to be problems, and there are problems uh, here and there. So what you do if you work with, for example, ChemStation or something like that, is that you go through your chromatograms and go through the different peaks and try to identify and handle uh, different problems. Now, if you look at this particular little interval here, that's going to be a huge problem if you, if you were working in ChemStation, for example. Because we have co-elution, that's always a problem. We have retention time shifts, so people, uh, uh, peaks are not staying in the right position. We have baseline and low signal to noise, and all of these things are actually a huge problem in traditional uh, software. Now, when you look at it, you may think that it's easy, that's just two peaks, and we should be able to find that. But if you try this in traditional software, it's not going to be able to actually detect these two peaks. So how, how, do, how do normal software work? Well, actually, a lot of the traditional, I guess many of you are familiar with, but a lot of the traditional way of handling co-elution is that you emulate what people used to do in the good old days when you plotted your chromatograms with a plotter and you cut out with a pair of scissors and then you weighted the peak. That's how we were handling this not so long ago and probably still in places. And now people are using expensive computers to simulate exactly the same, which is really stupid because it's a bad idea and you're not making use of any of sort of your chromatographic insight. And imagine you had something like this. There's no way you can quantify that with a method like that. It's simply not going to work. Now, when I have overlapping peaks, so for example, if I have a situation like this, it could actually be nice to use Parafag to fix 
these overlapping peaks because Parafac should in principle be able to handle this. But there's one problem and that is that let, let's say I have uh, different samples here and let's say I have this little, uh, this one here, let's say, whoa, let's say that these are my Parafac components in the time mode. So what this is saying is that in every sample, every time I measure, I have the same two illusion profiles. And that's never going to happen because illusion profiles are going to shift back and forth from sample to sample. Sometimes you can handle it, but a lot of the times when you're doing targeted analysis, there's no way of handling this uh, perfectly. So Parafac actually doesn't work for this particular type of uh, data. But the guy, Harshman, who developed Parafac uh, in the 70s, he also developed something called Parafac 2, which does exactly the job. Because instead of having just one set of illusion profiles, it has one set for each and every sample. And that's exactly what we want. So now I'm going to get pure, let's say I'm doing GCMS, pure mass spectra. I'm going to get pure illusion profiles for each and every sample. And I'm going to get the concentrations in each and every sample. And that's really nice. He developed that in 72. He couldn't actually compute it, but he said he just wrote it on paper and said that's going to be really nice. Uh, and it was, but it took 20 years before anyone could actually compute it. Uh, so it's only now that we know that it is really nice. Okay, so with this, we actually have a tool for handling untargeted uh, chromatographic data. So what we do is that we take our data and we have to split it into intervals. Just like you do also with traditional software. You have to look at it bit by bit. So you have to split it up into small intervals, but it doesn't actually matter too much how you split it up because Parafact 2 is pretty robust. Here I've sort of done a Parafact 2 model on a certain interval and it found one compound and there's an illusion profile for each and every sample and another compound. Here I did another interval and another interval. And no matter which of these three intervals I do, I get the same spectrum and I get the same quantification for this uh, purple or whatever uh, compound. So it's not really critical, uh, but, uh, but that is a decision you have to make. How, how many intervals am I going to have or how am I going to split my data up? Now the other thing you have to figure out is how many Parafac components should I use? And that's not so trivial. Now, for example, let's say I was doing this interval. You might say that that's three compounds. Well, that could be, but it actually turns out that when we look into it, it's five compounds because we're, we're getting, well, actually, you see, we have here, there's not one, but two compounds co-eluding. There's no way you will find that sort of in a traditional approach. And we didn't know, but we sort of saw in the analysis. And we also get, and this is nice, we get a baseline, so we don't have to handle the baseline. The baseline is automatically handled by the Parafact 2 model. So it's handling the baseline, it's also handling the retention time shift. You see all these profiles here from different samples, they don't come out at the same time. But since Parafact 2 doesn't care about that, it doesn't matter at all. But we do need to figure out how many components. And there are some classical, like in, you're, you're familiar with PCA or PLS, you can do cross-validation. But you also know that it doesn't actually work in practice. I mean, you have to know your specifics of your data. And it's a little bit the same thing here. So what we did was that we tried to develop a, 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 a kind of an expert system for this particular type of data. So we took a lot of different chromatographic uh, uh, sort of uh, runs and different types of samples and we took all these many different intervals and determined how many components do I have in this one? How many do I have in this one? There's that, that was sort of expert decisions. So uh, we were pretty experienced in Parafact too, so we made some decisions. And then we tried to build features. How can we express if the model is actually taking too many components? First, we wanted to check the right number of components, but that turned out to be difficult. But it, it, it seemed that we could actually predict if the model is overfitting. And so that's what we made a mo an expert uh, system for. And we generated a lot of different features, like does the model suddenly say the illusion profiles are negative? Then probably it's a wrong model. Or does the model uh, suddenly have two spectra that are almost the same? All kinds of features, all the ones we could think about. And we found a hundred of those. And then we tried to classify, is the model 
overfitted or not. And we were able to do that. And it turned out the model was actually better than we were. We used some 200 samples for this. And when we reran on a test set, the model came up with different decisions than we do, but what we did. But when we went in and looked, it turned out that the model was actually better than us. It's not perfect at all, but it's better than the human sort of uh, choice. So we ran that, for example, on this one, and it said seven components. And when, you, when we looked at these components, these are the ones we find, we find that there are actually five different chemical compounds. Each of them has a spectrum that makes sense, sort of, uh, from a chemical point of view. And then there's two baseline compounds. That's pretty impressive. That's not something you would otherwise be able to find. And then you can take the Parafac 2 loadings, the spectral loadings, and you can put them into a software package like we use the NIST database and identify what's the identity of these. And then you automatically get a peak table and then you can do whatever you want. And that's basically how we can do this. So uh, that's really uh, working well. I want to show you one example. This is, we do, as I told you, we work a lot with food and gastronomy and we do a lot of aroma profiling. And this is one sort of traditional problematic area in, a, in, in aroma analysis because these two compounds, they always co and there's always problems figuring out exactly uh, how much of each there is. Well, it turned out that when we ran this through our system, we found that there were not two compounds, but six compounds. So we found the two compounds that we wanted, but then we also found two other ones that had a perfect match in the NIST database and made perfect sense from a chemical point of view, but we have never, sort of never seen them before. And that's pretty characteristic of the Parafac 2 model. We, we really find more information than we did before, so now we're going back and rerunning a lot of our old data because we get much more uh, information, well, much more. We get more information out when we run uh, uh, using the Parafac 2. So, so the fancy thing about Parafac 2 is that we handle retention time shifts and baseline and co -elution. Also, what is nice here is that we don't have limit of detection. Now, I don't know uh, if you're fundamental about this, but limit of detection is a really stupid construct if you don't need it. It, it makes perfect sense in an analytical, uh, sort of analytical chemical context, but if you're doing, you know, metabolomics and stuff like that, you want the concentration. So just because your signal goes below a certain value, it doesn't mean you have to set it to missing or something like that. It's still there, and it's still measured exactly as accurate as it was before. You're just not certain it's above zero, but that's another thing. You want that number, and if you don't get it, you're throwing away a lot of useful information. But here you get everything quantified, so there is no problem with limit of detection. It's actually also fast. You, you only need to spend in the half an hour on setting the intervals and an hour to go through the models, and that's it. And then you need to let it compute a little bit. And if you work with, you know, Amdis or ChemStation, you know that working on 100 samples can take days easily. And if you give your samples to someone else on ChemStation and tell them to do it, it'll still take days and they will get a different result. Because there's so many parameters you have to set and you're never exactly sure what they are, so, and they make a difference. So, so it's not robust across different operators. But here it's pretty robust because the decisions you have to make are not really critical for the identification or for the quantification. Okay, these were two examples of uh, how we use uh, tensors. Uh, so I hope I've sort of indicated that, that it's interesting. It's especially this mathematical chromatography, but it's also actually about noise reduction. I didn't show much about this, but if noise is critical, multi-way models have much better noise characteristics than unfold models. And in these cases, the models are also very intuitive and easy to interpret because they're very, very uh, chemical. If you want, you can find a lot of MATLAB files and stuff like that on our homepage. We have tons of data and, and nerdy MATLAB programs. It's not, nothing is user-friendly, but it's all available and almost documented. Uh, so, so you can go there and, and uh, play with all kinds of stuff. Thank you. Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. Um, on a le temps pour quelques questions. Douglas. Ah.
Very good, as usual. <laughs> Very nice. Um, the case where you noticed new compounds that you hadn't detected before, and you looked them up in the NIST database, uh, do the retention times correspond to the ones you actually do? Yeah. yeah, that's uh, really a further is, proof. I mean, this is classic. People have been working on this for 30 years. <laughs> no one has seen this. Yeah, well, but that's uh, not an extra argument. Yeah. It is? Yeah, it is. It's really nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, a practical question about Parafact 2. If you want Parafact 2 to handle uh, to, uh, retention time shifts, uh, I understood that you have to run to several analyses of the same sample over time to, to have data about the, that time shift. Is, is it right? You have to have several samples, yes. You, you have, have to have several samples. You have to have a freeway array, sort of. Mm. Actually, not completely, but you have to have several samples, several variables, and several time points. But several analyses of the same sample? No, 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 no. Okay. No. That's not that. I, I never have, well, in these cases, it's all different samples. These are different wine samples. Uh, each of them are different. Yeah. Just one GC measurement. That's, that's probably the same question, but it means that for the addition, you don't need to have any warping process? No. Well, within reason, you, you, you're right, exactly. We don't need the warping except we need to be able to find these intervals. So if sometime, you're, if you run uh, your, your chromatography over months, you may have severe shifts and it becomes impossible to actually see where the intervals are. So you, you need, well, it depends. Typically our studies are short, so we don't need warping. But if you have huge shifts, it might be difficult. I have to be sure that all my compounds are in this region. And that could be a problem. So you need to shift a little bit. But it's not like critical. It's more getting them approximately on the same spot. You may need that sometimes. We don't normally, but, it, but sometimes we, it, people do. Maybe I will ask one. Uh, the, the assumption is that you have the same compound in each sample. In most? In most of the sample. Mm -hmm. But when you are doing it with a metabolomic study, maybe you have two situations where particular analyte are completely absent for one modality. How, how, how yeah. can you handle this? Well, if you look at this, the purple one is only one sample. So, so I mean, that, that would cost but a little bit, I think, to what you say. Mm. Uh, it, I mean, it, it, there has to be something in common overall, but in this particular case, this compound was only one sample. Yeah. And that works, but it's not. But it could be also an artifact. Yeah, yeah, could be, yes, yes, yeah. could be, yes. So when you go back to the, to the, to the pure signal, you go yeah. back to the MS spectra. Yes, yes. Uh, what, what are the, the score of the Exactly, we typically try to match it up and see does it make chemical sense. And if it doesn't, we may have to go back. I mean, it's not perfect at all. I mean, it can, and also, I have to stress, this can, of course, break down. If you have isomers with exactly the same spectrum, it's not going to work. Of course. Also, it, similarly, if you have samples that are, are completely correlated in concentration, that's the same as having same spectra. And then you will have problems. And maybe a last question. It works also because you have GCMS and the GCMS spectra are quite stable. Yeah. Did you try with LCMS where yeah. we have difference in uh, MS spectra? Yeah. Yeah. It works in LCMS, but LCMS is intrinsically uh, more complicated. But I mean, conceptually it works, and it'll, it'll also fail miserably at times. Uh, and sometimes L LCMS data can be pretty interesting. And, and, uh, and it assumes that this is a reasonable model. And if it is a reason, you know, like you have illusion profiles, spectra, and concentrations, and that's it, and some baseline. And if that is the case, it'll work, okay. sort of. You said that uh, in the case of a single excitation emission spectrum, yeah. ICA would have problems. Yeah. And I agree. Yeah. Uh, have you applied it to a whole series of spectra? Do you still have problems? Well, I, I've, yes, but I, I'm not sure. But I, 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 what I've tried is, yes, I've tried it. And the problem, I think, is because the, the concentrations are not independent. So I'm not going to get sort of, if I wanted Beer's Law real spectra, 
I, well, I would need to have some kind of independence, and I never have that in the samples I have. But maybe there are ways about that. But in fact, the independence is sort of uh, not the correct word for ICA. It's a strange idea to have that. Right, right, the idea right. is more the non gaussianity Right. But actually, because I'm a perfect guy, the way I implement ICA is through higher order sort of statistics, and then I fit a perfect model. Because the higher order statistics should be a super diagonal, mm -hmm. and they never are, not even approximately. And I think, but I'm not sure, that that's why it doesn't give me nice results. Of course, I get something that's a linear company. They look spectral, but, but it doesn't really give me pure spectra. But I'm, I, I'm not to say that it couldn't be made to work. I don't know. Okay. Okay, we should stop maybe the discussion as we'll be here. Thank you okay. again for the presentation. Thank you.